uh, or whatever it is. And I, I actually quite like Roger's approach, which I think is a sensible one, which is just say, of course, anything's a piece of art if you intend it to be a piece of art. If, if I were to say this wire is a piece of art, it can be a piece of art. Is it a good piece of art? That's the real question, right? Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Marlo Slayback and Tom Saroof. And our guest today is Fisher Derdarian, who's the president of the Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation. So welcome, uh, Fisher. Great to have you with us. Thank you. So glad to be here. Looking forward maybe to a, a good just, conversation. Absolutely. Maybe to start, we'll have you introduce yourself a little bit more. Who are you? Where do you come from? How'd you find your way to the, the Scruton Legacy Foundation? Stuff like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, as you said, my name's Fisher Derdarian. I uh, grew up in the Central Valley, California. And the farmlands out actually close to where Victor Davis Hansen lives, um, that general region. We went to school uh, at the King's College, New York City, a small Christian liberal arts school out in New York City, uh, and, and just had a wonderful time. And really, you know, didn't know anything about the liberal arts uh, entering college, had no idea, you know, what this great tradition was. Uh, admittedly, I think as, as probably uh, more people uh, uh, identify with and care to admit, I thought liberal arts had something to do with political leanings and was, and was confused by this fact, but said, you know what, fine, let's go ahead and check this thing out anyways. Uh, but, but I had a wonderful time and, and went in um, thinking economics. You know, this is, I, I had taken a semester of economics in high school, you know, as a good Californian uh, where I live, you know, we're required to do a semester of economics. And so I said, oh, economics, that seems interesting. Let's go to the King's College in New York, you know, we'll be in the heart of Wall Street. We'll get to learn about econ and finance and you know, and and so actually, I did my my senior thesis looking at the first bank of the United States and talking about Alexander Hamilton, which I started before the play came out. Um, though of <laughs> course, when it came out and I was reading the Alexander Hamilton books on the train, I felt like every other little fangirl uh, in Manhattan at the time. But so be it. Uh, there there are worse people that we can fan uh, about than than Alexander Hamilton, I think, in the United States. But um, in the course of, of my studies at the college, got into philosophy. You know, I remember reading Plato for the first time uh, and having my eyes open and saying, OK, I mean, this is interesting. This is still a bit pie in the sky. I don't I don't get it. You know, I want the the, the hard, you know, the red meat. Give me the politics. Give me the econ. Um, and fortunately enough, by the end of my four years, I had uh, forgone those ways and preferences and come to appreciate philosophy. And in the course of that, got introduced to Roger Scruton. Um, and, and, you know, there, there was a point, I think, in my senior year where I said, OK, I've read the old dead white men and I like a lot of them who are the, uh, the living people that I, I look up to and appreciate. Right. Uh, and, and that was my challenge, my senior year. And, and a couple people I had identified were Yuval Levin at AEI, who's a so great, you know, wonderful thinker, actually on the board of the foundation, um, uh, Peter Lawler, who unfortunately passed away, but was involved in ISI, uh, was the, um, editor of, uh, uh, what is it? Modern age. There we go. That's uh, right. Before Dan McCarthy. And then uh, Roger Scruton. Uh, and so, you know, I graduated, worked for the King's College for a little bit, was doing fundraising for the school uh, and, and got the itch to go back to school and quickly realized that, you know, graduate school, you have to uh, make a couple decisions. You know, one of them is, you know, are you going further in the academy? And if so, OK, that's one thing. You know, do you need it for your job? Uh, and if so, that's another thing. Or, you know, is there someone that you want to study with? Um, and that will actually be beneficial for the rest of your life. And that third one was the one that I decided going for because I realized Roger Scruton was teaching this MA uh, in philosophy in, in Buckingham, uh, which is a small, it's actually the first uh, pub, uh, private university, excuse me, the first private university in the UK. And it was founded in the 80s, believe it or not. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, right. when she was secretary uh, or minister of education, signed it into being. And then as prime minister, gave it its official charter, you know, and then was its first chancellor. But I, I say also say, you know, I, I did this program with Roger Scruton and in the course of it just said, you know, you are Sir Roger Scruton. You're this great, you know, conservative thinker. Let's find some Americans. Let's build something. And and he quite likely said, yes, yes. Well, whatever allows me to stay at home and feed my chickens while making more money sounds good to me. <laughs> uh, and so that that was the genesis of the Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation, believe it or not. Hey there, listener. I wanted to take a quick moment to thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission here at ISI is educating for liberty. If you'd like to join us in fulfilling our mission, consider helping us by rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to help us reach more listeners like yourself. Now, back to the show. So, 
Roger Scruton, I, I mean, to you, me and Tom, he's this giant in conservatism, right? And I'm sure for a lot of our mm-hmm. listeners, that's the same case as well. Um, but I also like to, when I say things like that, like to check myself because we're so steeped in this world. And perhaps even at King's College, you were somewhat steeped in that world. Um, I mean, having gone to a very, you know, mainstream public state school, I no, I, I can guarantee you most of my like professors or, you know, fellow peers, even in conservative groups, probably had no idea who Roger Scruton was. And mm-hmm. um, it was, I still remember when he passed away, I was like at a Barnes and Noble. And it was like the moment where like, it was like, I still remember where I was when Michael Jackson passed away because I was like a child. And this was the second time where I'm like, wow, this is, this is like cataclysmic because he mm-hmm. influenced so much of my own thinking and my, um, I think my, my conservative evolution of thought where I went from this more m- mainstream place of, um, thinking that conservatism was, um, a, a synonym for the GOP or whatever, for, for like electoral politics and practical politics. And he really just animated the, the intellectual tradition. Um, and especially, he also kind of infuses this, infuses it with this like an anglophilia, but also one mm-hmm. that is, I love his concept of oikophilia too, because one of my favorite, um, favorite things about Scruton, and I've told this story before, but I don't think I've mentioned it on this podcast is, um, he was very cosmopolitan at the same time. Like he was not, um, like he wasn't a, I wouldn't call him a citizen of the world by any means, yeah. but, but he still had this appreciation for particularity, whether that particularity was, was England for, you know, the English and people who, who loved these, these features of its tradition. Um, but also it was like Syria for Syrians. I remember going to the New York public library and just picking out this random book because I was interested in Syrian architecture and it was Marwa al Sabuni's um, home. It's called home and it's, it's about rebuilding Syria, particularly uh, Homs, which was actually where my mom is from, and it was totally destroyed during the war. Mm. And um, so she's, I would call her more of a mo- modernist architect. So to my shock, I open up the book and who, like, of course, it's Roger Scruton writing the foreword for the book and speaking so fondly about this architect who he met um, because she was trying to reach out to him. And um, mm. that really struck me just like how many people out there can be like this, um, this person who appreciates the particularity that conservatives appreciate about, you know, the, the, the communities that are closest to them, but also someone who does not try to impose it on the rest of the world while also realizing that other people have their own local attachments. So I give that kind of anecdote because I want to highlight how special this person was. So for you, you know, heading this organization, what is the Roger Screen Legacy Foundation doing to, honor this this amazing person that perhaps a lot of people might not be aware of even conservatives and who very much so you know i remember asking on a different podcast like who else who is who could we even compare to scruton so what are you doing to bring his legacy um to keep his le- legacy alive but also maybe make sure that um it's not something that's lost to i guess some of the the larger vulgarities that can yeah. unfortunately sometimes arise um among conservatives today yeah that's a very good question well you know i mean to the point that you just made marlo roger had such an interesting life and i think this is one of the things that immediately attracted me to him is that you know you, you pick up his book and he just has so many wonderful things to say uh, on the environment on art and beauty on architecture on philosophy on politics, I mean, you name it, sexual ethics, he has a book on wine and place, you know, all these different things. Um, and, and on top of that, the man himself was just so endlessly fascinating. You know, he grew up uh, in mid-century uh, England, uh, came into his own in the 70s and 80s as an academic, was teaching on aesthetics, so the philosophy of beauty, right? But then also started writing books on the philosophy of conservatism and trying to actually understand what does it mean to be a conservative? And in the midst of this, you know, essentially gets kicked out of the British uh, Academy because the new left is so uh, angry at him and and, and so uh, so against what he is for, right? Uh, and and in the midst of that, then he goes over and starts teaching in Central Europe, and going over and actually putting his life 
on the line and, and, and risking himself and having these underground lectures where he's getting together with small groups of people in crowded apartments and giving lectures on Wittgenstein and on culture, you know, and an opera and then uh, arranging all these different academics. I mean, I think he was a part of, if not establishing himself, three or four different organizations that looked at Poland, uh, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania during the times of the uh, Soviet Union uh, and was actively getting resources, smuggling resources and smuggling books in and set up a, a degree awarding program through Cambridge, through the, the Divinity Faculty, where I think they only gave two or three degrees at the end of the day. But, you know, imagine imagine your studies at university and, and the added difficulty of having to smuggle your, your writings in and out of your country um, and then wait, you know, a couple of weeks to receive comments from your professor over in another country and hope to God that you actually get to read them because, you know, the secret police are also looking at confiscating people like this, right? And so he comes back. Uh, and then at the same time starts doing all these different conservative uh, philosophy groups where Mark Thatcher is actually attending. And, and the story is that they were once at a meeting and Thatcher was talking about uh, privatization and, and you know, uh, these these different things. And, and Oakshot was the one who helped her come up with that that concept because she was saying to depublicize or something like this. And Michael Oakshot sitting there in one of the meetings and says, well, why not privatize? That's, that's a lot more catchier. Um, and, and suddenly, you know, Margaret Thatcher starts saying this, this idea of privatize, you know, um, uh, but, but I just say all these different stories to show how fascinating Roger was. And, you know, then he moves out to the countryside and, and has a farm and tries to, to bring this uh, farm life about and really, you know, come into this, I think, almost ideal of a, of a British kind of country uh, gentleman. Um, and so there was just so, so much to Roger. And I always say what I find that's really fascinating with Scruton is that he he's sort of a case study as to how to love your own well. You know, this true Geoport model, this true conservatism that says, you know, what's mine? How do I care for it? How do I, you know, cultivate it and foster it and leave it better for future generations? And I think Roger does that when he looks at the English tradition. And there's so much there that he talks about, whether it's in high culture and music or fox hunting and the environment and farming and all these things. That, you know, I'm, I'm a Californian boy, I come from rural agricultural lands. I've never ridden a horse. I still haven't. This is my great shame. Um, but uh, I've, I've read Roger. He has a wonderful book called On Hunting. It's 160 pages. And it talks about fox hunting and what it means. And it's, it kind of gives a philosophy to it. And I have to tell you, nothing before has ever really stirred this deep yearning uh, in me to get on a horse and join in the hunt. But, but there's something that I think Roger provides, which is that sort of look as to what it looks like um, to actually love your own well. And then after that, you know, you're starting to ask these questions. Well, what's mine? You know, what are my traditions? How do I love that well? And what does that actually look like? And what are the things that are particular to my small city or my, you know, county or region or state or even country? Um, that make us uniquely us. And this is the, I think this is the Scrutonian message at the heart of it, um, which is looking around and finding the things that you love, finding the things you care about, and then being able to care for them and actually help others see that there's inherent value. So I know that's a bit of a roundabout way uh, to get back to your question, which is, well, what are we actually doing to, to take forward the legacy? Um, so, so there are a number of programs uh, that we've been doing we actually have done uh, this past year, and we'll be doing this next year, uh, a seminar for undergraduates from around the West coming together for five days, you know, from the United States, from the United Kingdom, from all over Europe, and, and doing a five-day, you know, kind of deep dive into Scruton's work and into the wider Western, uh, well, humane tradition, I think that's the way to put it, um, but really trying to bring people together to, to have these sorts of conversations and ask questions, you know, who are we? Why does this matter? You know, where are we going? Um, and really, what is it that makes me me versus you you? You know, very simple questions, right? But these are the sorts of things that I think are so so important and and similar along the lines that that of the great work you guys do at ISI. But uh, otherwise, we've done a series of lectures. We've done some concerts as well. We did the worldwide concert premiere of an opera that Roger had written the libretto to. That was since set to music by David Matthews. Uh, we've done online interview series and book clubs. We're doing a number of projects along those lines now, some essay competitions and different things for college students. So really trying to find ways that allow students to engage and other people you know, who are interested in Roger's work to engage with his work, to think about it you know, with others. Um, and then also, I think, find people who are doing the good work that Roger was doing, whether that is in the academy or in the arts and culture, uh, or in you know the architecture profession, or wherever else it might be, in politics, even in business, and trying to support them and give them the resources and the network necessary 
to do good work, you know, to further that Scrutonian vision of loving one's own well. I think it's a great segue to get to our listener question, um, which is very, I think, aptly themed around Roger Scruton. Um, but our listener asks, or she says, uh, Roger Scruton's influence on American conservatism seems limited to conservationism, which is something that we can touch more on, um, and his understanding of his philosophy on aesthetics. Hmm. But what should his legacy or his place be in American conservatism in relation to Strauss, Kirk, Oakeshott, Frank Meyer, Vogelin, et cetera? What do you think? Hmm. That's a big question. <laughs> Ideally, you know, Roger would be one of those names alongside them, and I think he should be. Um, and, and it'll just be, to me, it seems a slow burn, right? You know, it's going to take some time for his ideas and his philosophy to infiltrate, uh, and, and come into it. And, you know, what, what's interesting, I think when you compare someone like Scruton to Kirk, Russell Kirk, both wonderful thinkers and fantastic, you know, Kirk, I, it, it, everyone always tries to do this, I think, which is give a sort of systematic, uh, um, understanding or approach to a question, a topic, conservatism and obviously we all recognize well this is the difficulty with conservatism you know you can't quite do that um and, and kirk gives his best best shot at it and i think it's a good shot i mean it really there's a lot of wonderful things in, in russell kirk's canon um and, and the difficulty is roger's not american so he's not dealing with the same questions for the american you know audience but again i, I think in that same way that i was touching on earlier you know there is that approach and that philosophical understanding um and, and there really is a philosophical basis for the conservative question of you know, who are we and why does that matter? Why should we care about these sorts of things? And looking at questions like sovereignty, um, questions like what is a nation state, you know, and, and how does that structure uh, compare and is perhaps better even than a lot of other structures that we've seen, uh, especially given, you know, who we are and where we are in the West. Um, so so that's it's a difficult question. I mean, what else can I say here? Um, you know, I, I, if, if Roger can actually or Scruton can actually affect these conversations though around you know questions like or issues like conservation around issues like aesthetics and all these other seemingly periphery issues i think that would actually say a lot to to his legacy as well because even though it doesn't seem you know foundational it's not you know the sort of straussian approach and question to the sort of you know philosophical conservatism or something like this uh, with big schools and big groups like claremont institute or whoever you know dedicated to kind of pursuing this philosophical vision within uh, applied politics um, it still actually shows that there has been a mass effect. And I think it shows this this kind of yearning and desire from a lot of people on the right as well to actually understand these things in a way that we haven't or we've not been able to uh, appreciate or, or actually not even ask the questions about. So for the example of the conservation and the environment, you know, Roger's one of the few, I think, conservative thinkers who have dealt with it in a really interesting way that tries to give us a language as to how to understand the environment and a role in, in being caretakers of it. I think you have a lot of good thinkers and writers in the States, of course, and there's wonderful agrarian movements and localist movements and a lot of different magazines. Um, but for whatever reason it is, it's never quite congealed in a way uh, because perhaps that's the beauty of it. I mean, this, again, this is always a conservative issue, right? We're so uh, pragmatic in a sense and, and caring so much about the local um, uh, uh, culture and approaches that we're unwilling to create some larger framework to understand these things. But I think Roger offers us just that and that ability and that language to be able to talk about the environment and say, well, of course, you know, oikophilia is kind of his, his central concern in the environment. And he says, this is that starting uh, um, motivation for conservatives, right? So, so this is the place where we all start because we look around, you know, what, what he means by oikophilia, and this is a, a term he coins, is uh, oikos, the home, and philia, you know, love of, so love of home. Um, and for him, the love of home means a number of things. It means the physical space that the home takes up. It means the home building itself, the architecture and, you know, what it looks like. It means the traditions and the culture that are captured within the home and the history that has gone into making that home, uh, as well as the language and the people in it and all these sorts of things. So there's this really interesting multifaceted understanding of the home. Um, and all of these things play into that conservative mindset so that when we ask questions, say, about the environment, it's not so much, well, you know, what's the state of carbon neutrality or what's, you know, how are we understanding all these different issues and the protocols and, you know, these all these uh, inter international questions and, and political fights. But it's, well, I really love the nature preserve down the street. How do I actually care for that? You know, what does it look like for our community to say these things matter? 
you know, I live at the, in a beach community. What does it look like to say, well, here's our beach. How do we actually care for that well? And does that mean we allow this? Does that mean we allow that? Does that mean we don't allow certain things? You know, what does that actually mean um, in, a, in a larger sense? So I think that's really one of those interesting things where, you know, if Roger can, can change the language around some of these issues, that would actually say a lot, you know, and of course, we'd love to see that philosophical conservatism, I think, permeate other things as well and other issues. But that's, that's a place to start and a place to start seeing Roger's influence now. I, I definitely recommend that um, anyone listening to this podcast, listen to or um, read and Fisher, you're probably familiar with this, but there's a great piece in the new criteria that he wrote in like the early 2000s called Why I Became a Conservative. And um, I think that's a great introduction to his own, um, I guess, kind of the the catalyst to this greater, you know, who we know now know as Roger Scruton. And his thought actually started because he was like a student in May of 1968 in Paris. And I'll actually, I'm pulling it up right now to read just kind of some of a sentence from this where he talks about um, destruction and some of the language he uses is now, I, I mean, I think of a lot of my, um, my friends who are kind of, you know, ISI adjacent, they're not as interested in um, the practical, not that, not that I don't think if you're interested in screen, you also can't be interested in like, you know, going out and knocking doors for a political campaign, obviously, that's important work. But um, one of the more popular, like slogans that I is, has almost become like, a, um, I've seen it grow in popularity among um, my friends and kind of ISI adjacent and Roger Scruton adjacent people um, is it's easy to destroy, but it's, you know, it's much harder to create and build. And he says in the narrow street below my window, the students were shouting and smashing the plate plate glass windows of the shops appear to step back, shudder for a second and then give up the ghost as the reflection suddenly left them. And they did, they slid in jagged fragments to the ground. So this, I really recommend readers um, or listeners li read this piece that he has in, in the new criterion because um, I, something about Scruton that I've also been trying to figure out is his relationship with faith because it's, it almost, maybe you could talk more about this um, Fisher because um, I think that undergirds a lot of, for conservatives, um, how we, it, it, it should be, I think it ought to be the building block of our, of our, what stems from that. It, it should be, I think the, the soil in which all of our other beliefs sprout when we're thinking about, um, you know, our, our political community and um, how we think about our relationship to the, to our communities, the world outside us, even when we're thinking of, um, you know, whenever Scruton talks about uh, love of nature and our stewardship, how we ought to be stewards of the land. Um, when I think of that, I'm like, oh yeah, of course, that seems so obvious. I mean, I'm personally, I'm a Catholic, so why would I, do, why would I go out of my way or why would I try not to, um, be, you know, modest in my consumption? Right. But for Scruton, it was a little bit unclear almost at times. I mean, I've, I've heard people describe him more as agnostic as, you know, maybe he never really, um, committed himself to a certain faith tradition. What are your thoughts on that though? And, and fr from his you know, his, I guess he, uh, converted to, or, you know, fully, you know, started became, became calling, began to call himself a conservative. What were some of the influences there? And did you see any kind of shifts in his thinking throughout his life? Were, and were any of them, like I guess if you can untangle what you've discovered about his own relationship with faith? Yeah, no, this is a really good question. And I mean, this this is the sort of question that much ink has been spilled, and I'm sure much more ink will be spilled, trying to, to ask, you know, and, and ascertain, was Roger a Christian? Um, and what's fascinating to me right now is that you have a handful of different camps. You have people say, of course, he was an Orthodox Christian, you know, small o Orthodox Christian. You know, people who say, well, he was agnostic. It's really ambiguous what his relationship was. You have people, which is the weirdest camp yet, uh, that says, well, no, he was clearly atheist and, and he really had these atheistic, you know, uh, commitments throughout his life and up to, up until his death. And, and I think it's just a complex question. Uh, and, and what I've really come to understand, and I think you have to just be mindful of when you approach someone like Scruton, is that he he understood himself as a modern philosopher. And what I mean by that is, you know, he, he said, we are firmly in the modern era. There is no way that we can return 
so to speak, to a former era. We can't roll back the time and uh, undo the writings of the Enlightenment and undo all the historical developments that have led us to this point in which nation states are kind of the de facto political structure in the West. And we have to contend with Locke and with Kant and with all these different people. It doesn't always necessarily mean they're the most amazing thinkers and everything in them is 100% right. I mean, in fact, he was willing to criticize Locke and many of the Enlightenment thinkers um, uh, without fully embrace, you know, not fully embrace everything that they had to say. But ultimately, we couldn't undo that. We couldn't return to some prior era in which, you know, we just read uh, Plato and Aristotle and their medievalists or whatever it might be, um, even though we saw some of good things and, and appreciated um, the larger philosophical tradition. So I think that's that's an important kind of first first step. Second, you know, I would say on his faith explicitly, um, he, he had a bit of a journey of his own. So he grew up Church of England, which is to say not much at all. Um, you know, it's a, a very uh, whimsical and flimsy thing. I think Church of England, I hate to say, or forgive me, any, any Anglicans uh, that watch, anyone that's in the broader uh, COE communion. Um, unfortunately, you know, it, it's just lost its bearing. So I think what I, I've heard people say about the Church of England is, you know, you know, it's always there if you need it. But the good thing is you never really do. Uh, so, you know, you, you go on your way. <laughs> so so there was that. That's how he grew up, um, as any any good Englishman, especially in that time, did. Uh, and then it, when he was a teen, younger, you know, young adult, I think kind of left the church in some sense, wasn't really sure. There was a moment in time, actually, when he lived in France uh, and was married to a woman in France um, and, and joined the Catholic Church. But if you if you were to read um, his his uh, memoirs, Gentle Regrets, which is a beautiful book, and kind of gives reflections on all these different large themes in his life as he goes through and, and you know discovers books, as he discovers music and opera, as he discovers philosophy, and all these different major issues and themes that I think permeated throughout his life and became his focus. He writes on them in different beautiful ways. <laughs> Excuse me. And one of them is his faith. And he has this great chapter called Stealing from the Church. And so he uses this metaphor. He, he was living in, in uh, Paris at the time, or in France, or in France at the time, visiting some country church with um, a friend from, from Paris. And he says they go in, and they're looking around. It's a beautiful Catholic, little Catholic church um, in the countryside. And she sees some beautiful bottle or, or some, some, something that the priests use on the altar and, and you know, kind of looks around and just grabs it, puts it in her jacket, and walks away. And Roger says he's shocked and he just can't believe it. And, you know, he goes on and he says, I, I've turned this over many times in my head since. And, and I just keep asking myself, why was I complicit in that? What, you know, this is just a strange thing to do. But throughout the course of the chapter, he talks about, you know, how faith has permeated uh, civilization and how really the West is built along, uh, built on a lot of these Christian concepts. But he comes to realize that he doesn't actually believe it. And it's more of an aesthetic um, experience for him. And so in some way, he too is like this woman who just takes from the church and he doesn't realize it, but he, he finally kind of comes around to it. And, and at that point, I think decides to leave the church and he gets a, a, a divorce with, with this woman as well. And so he remains agnostic, I think, for many years. And, and this is what I, I like to call, I don't know what you guys, I call this sort of person, but there's a certain post-Christian conservative, if you know what I mean. You know, they'll say, well, I'm not Christian. I can't really take that reasonable, you know, as, uh, that position is a reasonable, justified position. Uh, but the truth is Christianity is so important to who we are in the West. And, you know, there's so so many important things to the Christian faith as to, you know, defines us in America and, and in our ethics and, you know, upstanding moral people and so on and so forth. So therefore, you know, I don't think it's all bad. It's just not for me. And I think Roger takes that position for many years. And it's not until I think in his 50s that he then comes back to the church and actually joins the Church of England again uh, and becomes a regular attendee, plays the organ in his local country parish, you know, meets his wife and gets married, <coughs> excuse me, has children and so on and so forth, and really settles back into this. Now, the question is, and you can read some of his pieces, especially even from the last few years of his life, there's still some some complicated you know relationship with his faith and and you you see comments and and again i don't know if this goes back to him as a modern philosopher or just the skeptical nature that he has where he says things are about jesus and whether or not you believe him to be a historical person here's why he's important and here's why the faith is important um and obviously anyone who fully believes these things and fully submits to the dogma of the church just in any sense not just you know the catholic church but the church at large um the small c catholic church shall we say uh you would say, well, no, Jesus was a historical person. 
Um, so, so there are these things that are open to interpretation. And I think, you know, many people like Dan Mahoney, who's a great ISI professor, uh, will argue that Christian uh, Roger was a full Christian and, and really believed it. And I think there are people like Anthony O'Hare, who is a friend of Roger and a fellow philosopher, argue that Roger's relationship was much more complicated. And, and ultimately, it's one of those things where I've landed, you know, in the sense that we all have to land, which is, you know, our faith is a, a very personal experience. And, and who knows? what one's relationship is with the Lord and what that exactly looks like. It's a little bit beyond me, but, um, but you can still see, I think when you look at Roger as a person that there was a Christian, a Christian belief there and a Christian life there. Um, just what the exact beliefs were involved in that life are, are a bit up in the air and open for debate and something that he has skewed. Even I know, you know, I have good friends who are Catholics that would sit with him in private tutorials, even in the last few years of his life and would badger him as, you know, these, these good Catholic Thomas thought to, you know, or what to do. Um, and it would try and really get him to engage and he would just demur and be very polite about it and find his way out and, you know, then go on to the next question and whatever it was they were discussing. That's a great question by Marlo and a great answer by you, Fisher. It actually reminds me of one of my favorite sort of modern contemporary people, or has been in the last few years, has been Jordan Peterson. Um, mm. Especially, you know, young man in high school and in college, sort of trying to figure myself out, what am I going to do? Um, and he's answering a lot of questions. One quest question he'll never answer straight is, are you a Christian? Do you believe in God? And he just, he demurs. Um, but I'm curious about, since he's such a revered figure in the sort of conservative, but even, you know, just the more tw general 20th century philosophical ecosystem on beauty and aesthetics, when we sort of mm -hmm. connect back to this question of faith and the relation between faith and beauty and these sort of transcendent goods, what is, I know he's written a book, it's like a beauty, a very short introduction, one of those uh, mega series. I've not read this book, mm -hmm. but it looks like here you're go. about to pull it up. It's right here. Yeah, yeah. that's the one. <laughs> Sitting on what my is, desk, of course. Yeah, what's his uh, read on what beauty is, why it matters, what it means mm -hmm. about the human condition, about the meaning of existence, things like that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. This is a great question, Tom. So, you know, I, I think a lot of conservatives, a lot of Christians try and play this very, you know, finagled game where, where they say, well, we have to understand true art and true beauty. And what that really means is we have a very specific, narrow definition of these things because we don't actually want to allow modern art and all of its ugliness to be allowed, you know, to be a part of true art or true beauty uh, or whatever it is. And I, I actually quite like Roger's approach, which I think is the sensible one, which you just say, of course, anything's a piece of art if you intend it to be a piece of art. If, if I were to say this wire is a piece of art, it can be a piece of art. Is it a good piece of art? That's the real question, right? And so this is this is the sort of thing that Roger says, you know, the Brillo boxes, they're art. Why not? That's okay. Warhol can say whatever his junk is, his art, as, as can the piss Christ and, you know, the, uh, the fermented calf and all these different things. It just doesn't mean it's good. It doesn't mean it's beautiful. And in reality, you know, we know beauty when we see it. So Ro Roger goes back to Immanuel Kant, the Enlightenment philosopher, German philosopher, um, and talks about aesthetic, uh, aesthetics, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the aesthetic interest. And really, you know, he says uh, there's this moment in which you're you're captured by a beautiful scene. Uh, that's something only rational creatures can do. So, for instance, the cow will be out in the pasture eating at the grass. He's not going to look up and, you know, sit and ponder and say, wow, that's a beautiful sunset right now. Can you just believe the way it's going over the hill and just really appreciate the moment for the moment's sake? But the human will, and he'll be walking the cow and then suddenly be struck by this beautiful sunset and, and something inside him will just capture him and hold him. Um, and, and there is some sort of experience that one has in these moments, whether it's, you know, a beautiful sunset or a painting or whatever it might be. Um, that captures you and keeps you interested in that moment and interested in that view, that that picture that you're seeing um, for its own sake. You know, it's it's an interest in its own sake. And it's not some something to further your own ends. There's no means that is provided by this painting or by this beautiful setting that you see, uh, but you're merely struck by its beauty. And we all know that. We all have had that experience. You know, as much as we might try and deny it, we know when a thing is beautiful and when it's not. And I think we... This is one of the great things about Roger is he doesn't play these games where he then tries to say, OK, well, to really understand beauty, we have to understand that, you know, it's X, it's Y, it's Z. Though he does give philosophical accounts for it. And, you know, there are things like form. There are things like shape. You know, there are things like color that are involved, say, in a good painting. But that doesn't define what 
beauty is necessarily because we can have so many different experiences of beauty um so I, I think first you know that's that's just one of those areas where roger really i think gets to the heart of beauty and our experience of the beautiful um and so then you start talking about art a little bit more broadly and uh and, and he gives us I think a roadmap or at least a way of approaching the art world, because then you start to ask these questions of other pieces and you start understanding and seeing that a lot of modern art is around ugliness. You know, it's about subverting beauty. It's not actually about beauty itself. It's not about capturing some quintessential, you know, human experience. Um, I will, I will uh, recommend to all your viewers to uh, go. I don't know if it's on YouTube right now. It's probably on Vimeo, um, but the BBC uh, in, in one of its most sensible moves to date uh, made a hour-long documentary with Roger Scruton called Why Beauty Matters. Uh, and it's a fantastic hour where Roger essentially gives his philosophical account for beauty, shows you all these various images and takes you around so you really get a sense of understanding. Uh, and in good fashion, the BBC has done it their, their very best to make it inaccessible to the uh, wider public. Um, so the only way you can find it, I think, is probably with Portuguese subtitles because God bless the Brazilians. They captured this and made it available on, you know, other websites for the rest of the world to enjoy and appreciate. Uh, but in it, there's a, a wonderful scene, which is, is one of my favorites. So you have to forgive me for, for using some language. But there's some modern artist who's trying to tell Roger about art and its purpose. And he says, you know, it, it, really to understand art, you have to understand that it's taking these mundane objects, these everyday objects and elevating them to a place in which you appreciate it. You know, and it, it really kind of flips the script. And Roger says, mm, yes, like a can of shit. <laughs> and and then you see you see this artist like, well yeah i mean you know it, yes but and and you know you just see this, this smug you know smirk kind of come across roger's face and you're there with them because you say yeah absolutely a, a can of feces is supposed to be beautiful that's what you're telling me you know and that's 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 what we're all supposed to say okay great you know i'm, I'm glad to know where you stand and you see this even with the uh, the protesters now right i mean just was it today they threw paint on the mona lisa you know, I, I say, this is one of my favorite lines, you know, what can you do to Deschamps' urinal? What's the worst thing that you could do to it? Throw paint on it? No. Use it for its proper purpose by urinating in it? Okay, but you're using it for its proper purpose. You know, what's the worst thing you can do to the Mona Lisa or to Botticelli's Venus or to any of these wonderful pieces? It's to actually trying to face it and show that, you know, it, it's not as exalted as it should be or something like this. So I think that's one of those fascinating things that Roger just gives us some good insights on uh, and really hopefully gives us this language in, in the West, uh, especially for conservatives, to start trying to appreciate and understand art and recognize that they're, you know, the canon is good, that the traditions are necessary, but they're also has to be innovation. And these to not just become heritage, you know, not just become historical artifacts, um, but to keep them alive and keep that tradition alive. We have to engage with them in a certain way and actually allow for innovations to continue. So that's some of the work that I'm, I'm trying to do through the foundation right now, actually, is really ask this question, how do we support the art world in a serious way? You know, obviously, conservatives have an appreciation for traditional art. We have appreciation for the larger Western tradition uh, and canon. Uh, and there's something important there that we all want and we all want to hold on to and continue to perform, whether it's in music or continue to appreciate, whether it's in a museum. Uh, but at the same time, we recognize that these things need to stay alive. We can't just be stuck in, in almost that same, I think, similar reactionary vein that the left gets into on these sorts of things where they say, well, you know, you can only have a very narrow spectrum of opinions. And for any piece of art to be good, it has to show these political opinions. You know, the right then says, well, you know, for any art piece of art to be good, it has to be 200 years old and that's all we can do or whatever it might be. Right. Or you get the opposite sort of nostalgic reactionary uh, view, which is what we do the Western uh, plains and frontiers and, you know, the cowboys and all that, which can be great. I don't want to deny great the cowboys because I love the cowboys. It's a Westerner, you know, I can appreciate all those things. Um, but, uh, but, but we have to recognize that these traditions are alive and they're moving somewhere and they're still hopefully going forward because we want cultural vitality. We don't want a dead tradition and a dead culture. I have a friend who's a jazz musician. I know it is, it's not Spencer Kashmanian, uh, <laughs> <laughs> who was on our podcast a few weeks ago, different jazz musician. And um, his, he's, I wouldn't call him conservative per se. So he, this might be where the fundamental kind of incongruence is, but I would say he's very adjacent to um, right wing, the, the political landscape to be, I guess, charitable. And um, he's very critical of, Scruton because he thinks that he has an almost reductionist view of art where it can be exclusionary at the expense of um, art that isn't, you know, like 
from the Italian Baroque period or like pre-Raphaelite or something. Um, and it's funny because when I think about this topic in particular, it's almost, it, it, you you see Scruton, you, you watch Why Beauty Matters and he's elitist, like just from his mm-hmm. aesthetics, his, his demeanor, it's very, um, it's very, you know, very cultured. He He's a very cultured gentleman. And um, you obviously have to be to be able to tackle so many different topics with like an encyclopedic yeah. knowledge, right? But there's also something I think extremely um, populist in the sense, I'm, and I'm using that term like with an appreciation for for common tastes that are mm-hmm. um, maybe you wouldn't describe them as being refined, but they they are. Um, there's almost this draw to, um, I guess, quote unquote. I don't I don't necessarily like to call all art traditional art. I think there's just so, there's so many different periods of art that one would, you know, refer back to and say like everything before like the cubists of like the early 20th century is traditional art when you would ask an artist from those periods and they think they're doing something avant-garde, right? Um, right. Maybe compared to previous art mov- movements they are, but there's a lot of nuance that's lost in that conversation, which someone who considers themselves a student of art history would say like, no, there, there's actually, you know, a historical sensibility that Scruton, that maybe I could see critics of Scruton thinking, oh, well, that's kind of lost in some of his commentary. Maybe mm-hmm. it wasn't. Like, I, I'm sure Scruton had much more um, insights about this than he did in his, you know, in his writing, because he's writing for a, an audience, maybe not. He wasn't writing a like, dissertation on this, right? But I guess I'm interested in your, your thoughts on, like, his he almost had this noblesse oblige, which I really, I think has, I, I don't know of a single person beyond like a handful um, from across the, like, throughout the world that have that sense of um, duty and obligation, whether it's educating and providing opportunities, whether they're through um, writing books that are for popular consumption on high-minded topics that are still accessible. Yeah. And you obviously don't see that in, you know, the, the American Academy in many cases, you don't have people who are producing works that are, um, I mean, of course, you could talk about the publisher parish trend where you have to, you know, you have to publish and sometimes it's not always for mass audience. Sometimes it's much narrower than that. But um, Scruton had this noblesse oblige where, at least I think he did, where he was writing for your common Englishman or your common who, whoever who could read beauty and and feel like they have... Um, even a rudimentary grasp of this topic, um, or they could feel like they can appreciate the same, um, you know, the same, um, you know, like a David sculpture by um, Bernini as Scruton would. Whereas mm-hmm. if you're in the sinecures or the, you know, the ivory tower of the Academy and you're talking to an art historian and they may be like, Oh, that's all. That's so, you know, that's, that's so lowbrow that these people love this art, but they think that, you know, my like toilet sculpture is out, you know, is totally unrefined. They just don't understand conceptual art, right? So yeah. what would you say about like that ability to be, you know, one with the people, like be almost have the 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 sensibility and sympathy um to be able to relate to normal people when you're this highly educated and you know you're able to hang out in high high society and um you know, have this study in the English countryside where you're just, you know, pouring over your books for hours. It's almost like there, there's these dual personalities, but that isn't historically uncommon to have, I guess, though, if you get what I'm saying, like, yeah, I yeah. guess no plus mm-hmm. speech, asking what your mm-hmm. thoughts on Scruton's, this, this temperament of his. Yeah. Well, you know, I think for, for Roger, the best way to understand him in a sense is going back to, to his conservative uh, his definition is a conservative intellectual. And there was one interesting talk I saw him give where he says the role of the conservative intellectual is to give the real reasons for not having any, but simply doing what is right, feeling and doing what is right, right? So let me say again, the role of the conservative intellectual is to give the real reasons for not having any, but for simply doing and feeling what is right. Uh, and so in this sense, he really was almost as populist. You know, he was a man of the people insofar as he said, no, actually those almost in, those inherited prejudices uh, that you've you've received from your family and those ways of being that where they say, do this, don't do that, you know, care for these things, don't care for those things are good. And in the same sense, you know, our, our t- faculties of taste are generally good. You know, you can see a beautiful painting. You can see 
David, and you can say, wow, that is beautiful. And you don't have to trust all these academics who say, well, actually, what you really need to understand is the history behind it. And once you get the sense of this, you're going to see it's really one of the most ugly things you can imagine. And, you know, and then they go on and on. And you say, no, well, shut the hell up, first of all, <laughs> because I see that and it's beautiful. Uh, right. So, so, I mean, there, there, there is something there. Uh, and what, what's interesting, I'll, I'll do a couple different points on, on this that I, I want to hit just as we, we talk about and think about these things. Uh, what what I think makes Roger different, and of course, you know, a lot of people get upset at him because he is elitist in this sense. He does have that old, high-minded sense of culture, but but I mean, he really subscribes to it, and he sees a role for high culture, and and you know, continues or picks up, I think, on Matthew Arnold's understanding, which is the you know the best that has been thought and said, um, uh, and and tries to make that sort of the pinnacle of culture and looking at classical music, and generally, you know, the Western tradition. This is one of the most significant achievements of culture. You have all these different movements. You have this group of musicians that are able to do it. Uh, and, and there's just something beautiful that happens between the harmony and the counter melodies and, and all these, you know, different chords and things that come out of it. Um, it's a, it's a real accomplishment. And what you have to understand when you deal with things like a, a aesthetic interest and aesthetic value, what's important is that you actually have that own experience yourself because you can't, you can't have it by someone else. You can't have it secondhand. An aesthetic value or an aesthetic experience has to be one, you know, with that personal contention. So you actually, you can hear that David is beautiful. You can hear that, you know, Botticelli's Venus is beautiful painting or uh, uh, Bach's um, cello suite is beautiful. But to actually experience it is something of its own. And then you can say, okay, well, I've heard people describe it this way. And now I understand why it's described this way. And again, what makes Roger interesting, and and even you know he he pushed back on this idea of beauty as a transcendent, uh, which is a, a fascinating conversation that you know we don't necessarily have to get into now. There, there's talks that he gave where he, he kind of makes this clear, and I, he talks a little bit about it in in this book uh, on beauty as well. Um, but but his argument is that there is objectivity in the subjectivity of our aesthetic experience, and what he means by that is, of course, each of us have our own subjective experience. That is living. You know, this is life. We each have our own experience that's informed by our own history and our own faculties of sense and all these different things. But what makes at least aesthetics different and interesting is that it is a rational activity insofar as it's an activity that only rational animals, that rational beings, humans can experience. And in so doing, you know, what happens is that we are experiencing something and we're creating an interpretation and an understanding of it. And through these understandings and interpretations, we actually try to argue for, say, the primacy of one piece over another, why Hamilton is good or bad or why, you know, you pick whatever movie it is or, or any of these sorts of things are good or bad. And, and these are actual rational arguments. And through this searching, you know, for agreement in which, you know, if I were to come to Tom and say, well, I just saw, I don't know, you pick a movie, Disney's latest, whatever, and I think it's awful. Tom would say, well, actually, I saw a fish and I think it's great. And let me tell you why. And then we're going to get in this rational discussion where we try and come to an understanding. And even if we ultimately agree to disagree, you know, there's still that that seeking of agreement. Um, and, and he likes to quote Kant and saying we're suitors for agreement. Right. So so we're trying to create some sort of sense of objectivity around these objects and create judgments in which we agree upon. So I think that's one really interesting aspect of all this. Um, that that's important to take in consideration is one, you know, you have to experience these things yourself. And then two, once you do, you're going to have a certain understanding and appreciation of it that you're going to then try and put to words and, and argue for, unless you really just don't trust yourself whatsoever. And you're going to fold and crumble, you know, whenever someone else says, well, actually, I think this piece is great. And let me tell you why. And, you know, and then so be it, whatever you, but, but that's, that's the whole point of it all. Excuse me. So there's that that piece. And then what I also want to say, too, on, on this kind of populism or everyday sensibilities, you know, one thing that Roger also really tried to work on was the aesthetics of the everyday. So he said, of course, we have this sense of high culture. We have beautiful music. We have beautiful paintings and, and sculpture and, and these sorts of things. Um, but there's also some sense in which the aesthetics or aesthetics permeate our, our regular lives. And so he would talk about architecture in this way, but even the aesthetics of a home. You know, there's there's a sense in which, you know, you you ask the the young girls to set the table and they're going through and they're trying to adjust things and say, well, this looks right. That doesn't. And, and this is the the question, the idea of fittingness. You know, does it fit? Does it look right when you set, you know, the fork down? Does it is it OK if it's like that or do you want it to be straight? 
and you're going to make those slight adjustments. And even as you go about in whatever small or menial task it is, we're going to seek that sort of fittingness. And it, you know, becomes all the more larger and more important as you look at, you know, questions of a frame of molding around the door or the way in which a building's being um, built or the different features of it. There's something actually really important that happens in this, in this question, in this issue of fittingness. Um, and so, yes, actually, we actually should care about the way our homes look. We shouldn't just kind of throw it to the wayside because these things matter. You know, they say something about us and they shape us. Our environments shape us. The things that we engage with shape us and affect us. And we're training ourselves to love things or hate things, you know, based on how we're engaging with them and what we're doing from day to day. So ultimately, all these things are affecting us. And it's not that that's the first and primary uh, purpose, say, of beautiful art or good art or art in general. But that is something that does happen to us. And we have to recognize and engage with that and, and try and reconcile ourselves to that in some way. Certainly. Well, I think it's a great place to end, too, because we are coming to the end of our time. Uh, this has been a great introduction to Scruton. And uh, he's a thinker I'm not even all that familiar with myself. I've only read a little bit of them through the ISI honors program. So I'm very glad to have gotten to explore his ideas more. And I will be reading that copy of beauty at some point in the near future, I'm sure. But thanks for coming on Fisher. If people want to follow your work, learn more about the foundation, where should they look? Where can they find you? Where can they find the, the, the Scruton legacy foundation? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a website, www.scruton.org. Very nice and simple that has, you know, all of our events that are going on. Um, and, and we have a number of things. Obviously, we also have a Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. You can find us all on there. And, and a lot of the events that we've done in the past um, are on YouTube. So you can go back. And, and uh, I'm, I don't know if I mentioned this when we were talking earlier about the environment, but we're in the middle of a series right now called Rooted, Cultivating a Green Philosophy. And the idea is asking the question, what does it look like for conservatives to engage with the environment? How do we come to have an understanding and a language and an approach and appreciation for these things that doesn't simply imitate the left and do what I like to call globalism light, you know, but actually says, OK, what are the uh, priorities of the local you know, community of the farmer that's working the land? And how does that actually work together uh, with these larger goals of caring for the environment, caring for the planet, being good stewards and so on? So that's one of the things that's ongoing right now that I encourage you to uh, to go find and sign up for our upcoming uh, uh, interviews on that. But find us online, send us an email if you want to get involved. We have a newsletter you can follow along. And uh, I'm also here to, to reach out to and talk to if you have more questions about Scruton, uh, if you want to attend some of our upcoming events um, or intern with us or anything of the sort. We're always happy to have bright young people get involved and want to do what they can to advance Roger's legacy. So uh, please feel free to reach out. And thank you, Tom and Marlon, for having me. A real pleasure to be here today. Oh, we were glad to have you. That sounds like a lot of great opportunities, so we commend them to our listeners. Thanks, Fisher. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out our website at isi.org resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age Articles, debates, lectures, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.